Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Prosto Hub and today we are going to discuss the final session of our topic Biomechanics of Dental Implants. I hope everyone has followed till part 2 of Implant Biomechanics and in our previous session we were discussing the scientific rationale for implant design and there we said that biomechanical load management depends upon two factors one is the character of applied load and the functional surface area. So under the characters we discussed the force magnitude, force duration, type, direction and force magnification and next is the functional surface area. So before getting into detail, I request everyone to please do like and share my videos if you are finding these videos useful and if you are new to this channel Prosto Hub, please do subscribe and support me and if you have any queries, topic suggestions or feedbacks, you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail id. So let's start without any delay. Now under functional surface area, we have to discuss the two important design variables that optimize the surface area. One is the implant macro geometry and then the implant width. The implant macro geometry, this topic has been discussed along with thread geometry as a separate session because it is an important short note. So here I will not be discussing in detail about the macro geometry of the implant. Those who wish to know more about implant macro geometry, please do watch that separate session. I will provide the link in the description box. So the shape of implant or the macro design determines the surface area available for stress transfer and it also governs the initial stability of the implant and it also has an important bearing on the bone response. So the bone it grows preferentially on protruding elements of the implant surface like ridges, crest or edge of the threaded surface. So we have already discussed the disadvantage of cylindrical implant in our implant macro geometry session that is fatigue overload due to shear forces. So we know that bone is weakest under shear forces. So in order to prevent this the thread design was introduced which maximized the initial bone to implant contact and it also enhanced the surface area providing primary stability and also facilitated dissipation of loads at the bone implant interface. Next the functional surface area per unit length of an implant can also be modified by varying the three geometric thread parameters that is thread pitch, thread shape and thread depth and width. We have already discussed in detail about these thread parameters in implant macro geometry session. So we have to modify these parameters in order to uh, increase the functional surface area. So one thing we have to keep in mind that is an ideal implant thread design should provide a balance between compressive and tensile forces while minimizing the shear force generation. So shear force should be the minimum. And uh, coming to the thread pitch, so we know that thread pitch is the uh, number of threads per unit length and smaller the pitch more threads are there on the implant body for a given unit length and thus greater is the surface area per unit length. So if we have to increase the functional surface area, we can decrease the thread pitch. Coming to thread shape, so the thread shape has also been found to influence the type of force transferred to the surrounding bone. So we know there are different types of thread shapes that is the um, square one, the uh, V-shaped, the buttress, reverse buttress and the spiral one. So among these thread shape, the shear force in a V thread and a reverse buttress thread is 10 times greater than the shear force on a square thread. So among all the thread shapes, the square one is the one which provides the best primary stability. Coming to the thread depth and width, thread depth it is the distance between the major and the minor diameter of the thread and thread width it is the distance between the coronal most and the apical most part at the tip of a single thread. So thread depth is found to be more critical for dissipating the peak stresses within the bone than thread width. So greater the thread width, greater is the functional surface area if all the other factors are equal. So these are the basic uh, geometric parameters that we can modify in order to improve the functional surface area. Next is the implant width. So an increase in implant width adequately increases the area over which occlusal forces may be dissipated. So the implant width is directly proportional to the bone implant contact area. And also uh, the 
wider diameter implants enhances the bending fracture resistance but the crestal bone anatomy often constrains implant width to less than 5 mm and this is because of the stress shielding effect that is reduction in bone density as a result of removal of the normal stress from bone by an implant so studies shows that implants wider than 5 mm do not transfer adequate forces to supporting bone leading to disuse bone loss which is called as the stress shielding effect which we have already discussed in our implant protective occlusion part 2 next coming to the crest module considerations so crest module which has already been discussed in detail in our implant macro geometry session is that portion which engages the crest of the bone and it is designed to retain the prosthetic component so this portion is called as the crest module and the diameter of the crest module should be slightly larger than the major diameter of the implant body in order to reduce stress on the cortical bone and the crest module should seat fully over the implant body providing a deterrent for the ingress of bacteria or fibrous tissue and the seal created by the larger crestal module also provides for greater initial stability of the implant following placement now the design of the crestal module contributes to crestal bone loss so there are three basic designs of the crestal module that is the parallel sided divergent and convergent so earlier there were polished collars in order to prevent plaque accumulation but these longer polished collars resulted in crestal bone loss due to increased shear loading and then uh, they introduced micro thread configuration onto the crestal module which improved the bone formation and also stress distribution for the implants next let us discuss the apical design of implant that is the round cross sectional implants do not resist torsional shear forces when abutment screws are tightened that is those with circular apex has got low torque resistance hence anti rotational features are incorporated usually in the apical region of the implant body so that include uh, vents holes grooves etc so bone can grow through these apical hole and they resist torsional loads applied to the implant and the apical vents also increases the surface area available to transmit compressive loads on the bone but a major disadvantage of this apical vent is that when implant is placed through the sinus floor or is exposed through a cortical plate the apical hole may be filled with mucus and may become a source of retrograde contamination again the apical end of the each implant should be flat rather than pointed that is flat surfaces increases the surface area and also place the surrounding bone under constant compressive load whereas pointed apex increase the stress concentration next coming to single tooth implant biomechanics so single tooth implants require good bone support and also we have to control the harmful effects of occlusal levers that are not parallel to the long axis of the implant and also the processes should be designed in such a way that it allows for good oral hygiene with easy access to interproximal surfaces and also to the retaining screw to avoid excessive loads implants must be centered in the edangular space during placement so if you want to replace a molar it can be either replaced with two standard diameter implant or one wide implant but in case of an anterior uh, restoration usually wider diameter implants are not advocated because it may compromise the aesthetic results so usually in anterior single tooth restoration a standard diameter implant is preferred and narrow implant is also not preferred because uh, the standard diameter implant provides larger surface area for osseo integration when compared to the narrow diameter implant and to avoid the levers Uh, that may be produced during para function in centric and eccentric positions it is recommended that the implant supported restoration should be left out of occlusion coming to cantilever prosthesis biomechanics so we know that cantilever prosthesis is the one which is uh, supported on one end and other end is free standing and uh, here they experience greater torque with distal abutment acting as the fulcrum so how these the cantilever processes affect the implant protective occlusion we have already discussed in rpo session 
and there we said that the cantilever processes actually act as a class 1 liver and so the cantilever processes actually benefit from a gradient type of force that is heavier occlusal contacts should be applied over the implant bodies and gradually it should reduce towards the cantilever in order to reduce the magnification of stresses. Here is a stress map that shows a posterior rehabilitation with different cantilever length and incidence of 100 Newton load and it is clearly illustrated that higher the lever arm higher is the stress concentration and in the biomechanics we said that uh, cantilever structures experiences more bending forces and so their single support anchorage should have more strength for long term survival. So according to the uh, Bernoulli beam theory when a bending force is applied on any beam you can see here when a bending force is applied on any conventional beam the uh, upper surface of the beam will experience compression and the lower surface usually experiences tension and the point where these compressive and tensile forces cancel out each other is called as the neutral axis. So this is the neutral axis. So in case of a cantilever the superior surface near the support will experience tension and the interior surface experience compression and the neutral axis is actually more superior on a cantilever beam compared to that of a conventional beam. So the neutral axis is little bit more superior than the conventional. So here connectors and cantilever restriction needs to be broader near the occlusal surface in order to withstand these occlusal forces. Now how we determine the length of the cantilever? We know that it is by anterior posterior spread that is distance between the most anterior and most posterior implant is used as an indicator to determine the length of cantilever. So usually the formula is the cantilever span is 1.5 times the anterior posterior spread. Now other than this AP spread there are many other factors that influence the length of the cantilever and they are the choice of material the arch form that is the tapered arch form have larger anterior posterior spread and so can handle longer cantilevers and then the implant length and diameter so wider and longer implants can withstand longer cantilever and the length is more significant than the width again the para function so in patients with para functional habits like bruxism it is advisable to limit the extent of cantilever in order to minimize the unfavorable forces acting on the implants next one is the bone quality so cantilever length should be reduced by 6 to 8 mm in order to compensate the poor bone quality or so, so that is especially in case of maxillary posterior region Next factor is occluso gingival height. So we have already discussed this in our IPO session. That is the crown height with a lateral load act as a vertical cantilever called as a vertical offset. And it is a magnifier of stress at the implant to bone interface. And finally opposing arch that is either natural tooth or an implant supported restriction. So these are the other factors other than AP spread that influences the length of the cantilever. Next is the biomechanics of framework and misfit. So in implant prosthodontics, gold and gold alloys and also other metal alloys like cobalt chromium, they have been traditionally used as the gold standard materials for fabricating framework. And they increase the process stiffness, protecting implants from overloads and also reduces the risk of technical complications. Later on, titanium and alloys and also zirconia were introduced as alternative materials and uh, they were also highly bicompatible and also they prevented galvanic corrosion which is a typical disadvantage of non-noble metal alloys. So these metal frameworks of the full arch processes also fractured especially in the cantilever area. So the reasons were the overload of the cantilever and also metallurgic fatigue under cyclic load. So this can be prevented by uh, substantial increase of the cross-sectional area of the framework. Next is the passive fit. So what is passive fit or ideal fit? So passive fit is also important in order to achieve a long lasting outcome for dental implant treatment. It refers to the relative looseness or tightness of the surfaces of the implant and the prosthetic component. That means when there is uh, no applied external load, framework should not induce any strain on the implant components and the surrounding bone. So this is known as passive fit.
So when there is no passive fit, that means there are micro gaps present between framework and abutment and that is called as misfit. So these induces excessive and large external preloads on the implant abutment and also the fixation screws which can cause loosening or fracture of the screws. So when there is a discrepancy present, the processor should be again sent back to the lab where it will be sectioned and welded or refabricated. So there are several techniques to determine the amount of this uh, framework passivity and also there is the Kenos classification of misfit. So if you want to know in detail about these, you can comment below this video. Next is treatment planning based on biomechanical risk factors. So there are four basic biomechanical risk factor, the geometric risk factor, occlusal risk factors, bone implant risk factor and technical risk factors. Coming to the first one that is geometric risk factor. The first point is the number of implants less than number of root support. So it is important to consider the number of root support that we need to replace instead of the number of teeth that we need to replace. That means canine represents one root support whereas molar represents two root support. So when we are replacing a molar, if we are replacing with a single implant, it creates a geometric risk. So this risk can be decreased by using either a wide platform implant or by using two regular platform. So it is important to consider the number of root support that we need to replace. The next is the wide platform implant. So we have said earlier, implants that are wider than five millimeter, they do not transfer adequate forces to supporting bone, leading to disuse bone loss. That is the stress shielding effect. Next one, implants connected to natural teeth, which is called as the tooth implant supported processes. So this again will create technical and biological complications. The next, next point is implants placed in a line. So when the implants are placed in a line, it represents a severe risk of overload. So it is necessary that the implants should be spread along the alveolar ridge and should be placed in a tripod configuration. Next one is presence of prosthetic extension that is cantilever. So we know that as the length of the cantilever increases, it again causes uh, more stress. And finally, excessive height of the restriction, which is called as a vertical offset. So when there is excessive height along with lateral load, it again causes a uh, liver force that will again result in occlusal overloading and stress concentration. So these are the geometric risk factors. Next is the occlusal risk factors. So the occlusal risk factors are occlusal overload, para function, lateral occlusal contacts, etc. So among these, occlusal overload is considered to be one of the main causes for peri-implant bone loss and implant processes failure. So because of this occlusal overloading, there is a crestal bone loss, increasing the anaerobic sulcus depth and resulting in peri-implant diseases. And also in case of para function, so when treatment planning such patients for implant supported restoration, a general assessment of the likely load that is to be placed on the implants should be made. So if the patient is a bruxer, clinician should plan additional implants to allow for more favorable load distribution. So we know the implant protective occlusion which was developed by MISH, which was designed to restore an endosseous implant by providing an environment for improved clinical longevity. So we have done a separate session on implant protective occlusion. So for more details, you can watch that session. I'll provide the link in the description box. So as per this IPO, uh, there are five features that is needed to protect the implant from occlusal overload. And they are provision of load sharing occlusal contacts, modification of occlusal table and occlusal anatomy. So as per MISH, occlusal table of implant supported crowns should be up to 30 percentage narrower and it is always recommended to avoid exaggerated anatomy like sharp cusp and deep grooves. So we know that cuspal inclination should be shallower as per IPO. The next feature is correction of load direction. So we know that the primary contact should always be along the long axis and not at an angle. Then the increased implant surface area. So Mish recommended to increase the implant width to improve the surface area. A 1 mm increase in width can increase the surface area by 30 percentage and decrease the force on the bone. The next feature is elimination or reduction of occlusal contacts in implants with unfavorable biomechanics. So in case of cantilevered crowns, it should be free of contacts in centric and eccentric position. Similarly, in full arch restrictions, 
the distal cantilever segments should be designed with a narrower occlusal table with minimal occlusal contact to reduce force on the implant. So these are five features that are needed to protect the implant from occlusal overloading. Now, apart from the previously mentioned features, implant supported prosthesis should fulfill the following principles of IPO and they are anterior guidance when possible, bilateral stability in centric occlusion, wide freedom in centric, evenly distributed occlusal contacts and forces, non-interferences between the retruded position and centric position and finally smooth even lateral excursive movements without working or non-working interferences. So these are the basic principles of IPO. As I have said earlier to know in detail about IPO you can watch the separate session on implant protective occlusion. Next is the bone implant risk factors that include dependence on newly formed bone absence of good initial stability and smaller implant diameter. So while placing an implant, we have to consider the biologic factors like bone quality, bone quantity, cortical bone thickness, etc. And also we have to give proper healing time before loading an implant and this will give the time for the bone to properly remodel which improves the bone quality by replacing the primitive woven bone with a mature and viable lamellar bone and also it leads to functional adaptation of the bone structure to load by changing the dimension and orientation of its supporting elements. Next is absence of good initial stability. So primary stability is of utmost importance and it is very much needed for the successful clinical outcome of implant processes. So we have to assess the initial stability at different time points in order to ensure a successful osseo integration. Again, the factors that influence primary stability are bone quality, quantity, implant geometry and the surgical technique that we adopt to place an implant. Finally, smaller implant diameter that to in the posterior regions. So, smaller diameter implants tends to fracture more when compared to that of wider diameter implants. So, uh, while placing an implant in the posterior region, at least a 4 millimeter diameter must be needed and this will increase the surface area and it will enhance osseo integration. So these are the bone implant risk factors. Finally, coming to technical risk factors that include lack of prosthetic fit. So the misfit at the abutment implant interface or the absence of a passive adaptation can lead to fracture and the most common technical complication in implant is the fracture of the abutment screw. So in order to prevent such technical risk factors, we can follow proven and standardized protocols, use pre-machined component and also instruments with stable and predefined tightening torque. Coming to the warning signs before an implant fails, they are repeated loosening of the prosthetic or the abutment screw, repeated fracture of veneering material, fracture of the prosthetic or abutment screws and bone resorption below the first thread. So generally bone loss up to first thread is considered as physiological remodeling whereas bone resorption below the first thread is again a warning sign. So concluding this session, the success of dental implants depends on proper understanding of basic biomechanics and to a large extent the biomechanical consideration for implants follows simple mechanical rules based on leverage principles and by considering the patient's functional behavior, limiting the extension of processes and controlling the occlusal pattern and contacts, possible overload situations can be minimized and thus it enhances or improves the prognosis of the implant processes. So biomechanics is one of the most important considerations that affects the design of the framework of an implant bone processes and it must be analyzed during diagnosis and treatment planning as it may influence the decision making process which ultimately reflect on the implant supported processes. These are my references. So thank you everyone for watching this session. I hope everyone have followed well the basic biomechanics of implants and if you have liked this video please do like, share my video and also subscribe to my channel ProstoHub. And if you have any queries, feedbacks or suggestions, you can comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So it's a bye from Prostohub until our next session.